It is really good to be here with you guys. It is pretty exciting to gather this many women to take a serious look into the Word of God together. And in the course of this breakout, we're going to have an opportunity to take a look at what it means to be created in the image of God. This is a topic that I feel strongly about because as a Bible teacher, what I'm always trying to convince women of is that the Bible is uh, not a book about you. The Bible is a book about God. That's right. I know it's after lunch and I know you're kind of far away from me, but I do want you to talk back. The Bible is a book about God. It's a crashingly obvious statement. It's a statement that no one in this room has probably ever disagreed with in their entire time of interacting with the Bible. Uh, The problem is that though we would all attest that the Bible is a book about God, many of us fall into a habit of not reading it that way. We fall into a habit of reading it asking, who am I, who am I, who am I, who am I, as we're looking through its pages, and yet what is the Bible telling us from Genesis to Revelation? It is a declaration of the nature and character of I am. It is telling us who God is from the beginning to the end. And it's important for us to understand who God is because as John Calvin points out, The knowledge of self and the knowledge of God always go hand in hand. In fact, there is no true knowledge of self apart from the knowledge of God. And what he means by that is that we have a tendency as human beings to measure ourselves against something to sort of see how we're doing, right? That's what we would call self-knowledge, like whether you perceive yourself to be doing basically well with the whole sanctification thing or not is probably a judgment you've reached in relation to someone else you know, some other image bearer. That's kind of our human nature, is to look around us and say, yeah, I mean, I did have a problem with selfishness, but I've really been working on it, and I'm not as selfish as Susan, so I'm rocking it. (laughs) And that is why we need a vision of God high and lifted up from the scriptures. Because we will not only not have true knowledge of self if our measuring rod is another human, um, but we will deceive ourselves that we are doing better than we are. We will tell ourselves that it might have been bad or it might still be a little bad, but it's not as bad as it could be, so it's going okay. Uh, And the knowledge of God does to us what it does to everyone who ever sees a vision of God high and lifted up. What does it do? It rightly orients us to God and to others. And if you think about this, we see this pattern throughout the scriptures. Uh, We see it in Isaiah chapter 6, right, where Isaiah beholds a vision of God high and lifted up. And what is his immediate response to that? Because, you know, let's think, before we get to that question, just think about what we think our response would be if we were able to see God. We think that we would be like, oh, turn on the praise music. Let me twirl in that field. (laughs) We think that's what it would be like to see God. But that is not what the response of people is in scriptures. Jackie touched on this in her message last night, that when Isaiah sees a vision of God high and lifted up, he has an immediate awareness of what? Sin. He says, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And then what happens? God responds. The angel touches his lips with the coal, tells him to go and do the work of the Lord. But understanding who God is gives him a right understanding of who he is, and his response is to cry out, oh, Lord, repentance is what happens. Think about Peter in the New Testament, where they've been out fishing all night long, and Jesus is in the boat with them, and Jesus, who is actually a carpenter and not a fisherman, Peter, who is a fisherman, and all of the other guys who are there who fish for a living, and Jesus suggests that they throw the nets over on the other side of the boat, and Peter, with an almost discernible eye roll in the text, is like, okay, we'll do what you say. We've been out here all night, but we'll give it a try. And you know how the story goes, right? There's this miraculous catch of fish. They're trying to haul in all of the fish, and the nets are breaking, and they can't even believe how many fish there are. And it's Peter's response, we're all going to be rich, and we can retire from fishing. Does he twirl in a field? No, he turns and he looks at Jesus, 
who up until that point he thought was probably just a gifted teacher. Not really sure, still fishing for who he is. No pun intended. <laughs> and he looks at him with different eyes because he's just seen something miraculous happen and he understands that he's having a vision of God. And what's his response? Falls to his knees and says, away from me for I am a sinful man. The knowledge of God and the knowledge of self go hand in hand. When we see who God is, we understand ourselves rightly and it changes us. It makes us want to be free from the sin that is revealed in us. So it begins to write that vertical relationship, but it also begins to write our horizontal relationships as well. Because that great command to love the Lord our God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself, when we are rightly oriented toward God, when we recognize the difference between him and us and the fact that he has extended relationship to us anyway, then we can turn to our neighbors. And when we are tempted to say, you know what, I'm better than you are. I don't know your relationship. We now look on them and say, if the Lord has established and maintained relationship with me, what I ought to do with them. The knowledge of God and the knowledge of self always goes hand in hand. And so it's important that we understand rightly the way that the Bible speaks about God. And in telling women to read the Bible as a book about God, it has become apparent to me that we have an atrophied vocabulary around the things that are true about God. We have a hard time articulating the things that are true about God beyond some of the obvious ones, like some of the ones that you might know off the top of your head. God is loving, right? Like everybody knows God is love. Lost people know God is love. They like to tell us that all the time when we start listing off the other parts about God that they are less comfortable with. God is loving. God is gracious. God is merciful. Those three get a lot of air time. But then there are others that don't come up so often. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. And the things that are true about God in the Bible fall into loosely two categories. In the first category, we call his incommunicable attributes. Those are the omnis. Those are the infinite things. Those are the things that are only true about God. So only God holds all knowledge. You and I don't hold all knowledge. Even if you have a smartphone, you and I do not hold all knowledge. We are limited. And so we don't as ascribe during our lives to try to be like God in his omniscience. Or do we? So only God can be all powerful. Only God can hold all power. That is not possible for us because we're limited, right? Like God never rests, he never grows weary, he never flags in his strength, he never has to take a nap, he never has to go to sleep. But some of you right now in this post-lunch haze are thinking, all the blood has gone to my stomach and I wish I were in my hotel room curled up in a ball. That is God telling you something. You are not him. And we need those reminders and the Lord knows how often we need them because he sends us to sleep every night. And for those of us who are fortunate enough to work in a nap, sometimes he sends us to sleep twice in a 24-hour period. You are not omnipotent and don't aspire to be. So think about that list, the omnipotent, the omnipresent. Have you, has anybody ever aspired to be omnipresent? You're like, what? No, I would never do that. And yet some of you right now are wondering what's going on at home while you're gone. You're thinking about FaceTiming someone a little bit later. You're wondering if the DVR was set to capture your show that you don't want to miss while you're gone. Has anybody in here ever said, I just wish I could clone myself? <laughs> yeah, why? Because you actually do want to be omnipresent. You don't want to be confined by your body to one location. You would like to find a way to be in more than one place at one time. I would too. And what are we saying when we say that? You do want to be omniscient. That's why you love your phone so much. You do think that knowledge is power. You do want to be omnipotent. You do actually want to be the sovereign ruler of your own little universe. You do actually secretly pray, my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you know how I know this? Because I know my own wicked heart. So we have this list of things that are only to be true about God, his incommunicable attributes. 
And then we have this other list of things that is true of God, but can also be true about us. God is loving, we can be loving. God is just, we can be lo- just. God is faithful, we can be faithful. God is patient, we can be patient. There are things that are true about God that are only true about God, and there are things that are true about God that can also become true of us. And think about how those two lists relate to one another. How much time do we spend concerning ourselves with this list over here, the ways that we can become like God? that it's good and right for us too, even though we are limited creatures. Because I would guess that many people wake up in the morning plotting how they're going to exercise power over some situation in their lives. But not many people wake up in the morning plotting how they're going to demonstrate the perfect love of God all day long. We gravitate towards the things that are only supposed to be true about God and we avoid the things that can also be true about us, and yet this is the list that we are called to. This list of things that is true about God that can also be true about us is pointing us toward our greatest purpose. Why were we created? Why were we created? Genesis 1.27 says, God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You don't ever have to ask why am I here, because the Bible has already told you. You're here to bear the image of God. What does it mean to bear the image of God? Well, it means that we want to take on these things that are true about God on this list over here. We want to be more loving, we want to be more faithful, we want to be more kind, we want to be more patient. Because this other list over here, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, sovereign, all of those, those things that can only be true about God, when we reach for those, we are working to fashion an idol. We want to say, I am, instead of acknowledge the I am. But when we work toward this list over here, We're actually striving to become who we were always intended to be. So I brought a quarter up here. I actually had to borrow it because I didn't have any coins, because that's where we are these days with the monies. But I have this quarter here, and it has a picture of George Washington on it. This is liberty above his head. So it has an image that is stamped on it. But it's pretty worn down. In fact, I can't even read the date on it right now, and I can barely see George's face. I kind of had to look at it for a second to make sure that that was who it was. It's got an eagle on the back. It's recognizable, but it's gone through a lot of wear and tear, and it's a little bit hard to discern what's on it anymore. How is this like you and me? What does it mean to be created in the image of God? What does it mean to bear his image? Does it mean that my physical body looks like God who does not have a body? No, it's not that. I mean, it might be that there's something about our physical bodies that is pointing to something that's true about God, but image-bearing goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. Image-bearing means that we are God's representatives here on earth, that when people look at us, they should see things that teach them about God. And Genesis 1 tells us that we're created in the image of God, but Genesis 3 tells us that something terrible happens to that image. Now, it is not completely removed from us at the fall, but it becomes so marred in us that it's difficult to discern. Every human being has value, whether they are a Christ follower or not, because they are made in the image of God. Everyone is an image bearer, whether they know it or not. But the children of God know it, and they live lives where they seek to see the image of God clarified and restored and brought out in them. Have you, have you ever wondered what God's will is for your life? Has anybody ever asked that? Are you asking it right now? Is there something that you're wondering, what is God's will for my life with regard to X, Y, or Z? Let's have a little show of hands. Who's asking that question right now? That's good. 
It's a, it's a pretty common question for Christians to ask, and it's a question that I've heard asked in the church my whole life. And the idea, as far as I can tell, within Christian subculture is that God has stuff that he wants you to do. And your job is to figure out what it is. But he's not going to tell you. You have to go looking for it. And the people, and then you meet people and you're like, they're better at this than I am. Have you had this happen? Where they're like, and I just sense the Lord telling me to do X, Y, and Z. And you're like, really? Because I just stared at the wall for three hours and got nothing. (laughs) And so we almost can have this hierarchy of believers where there are those of us who are better at hearing God and going after whatever it is that the Lord told them to do. And for years I thought, gosh, I'm really not good at this. I'm just really not good at this. And the will of God has been presented to me much of my life in the church as this secret thing that I'm not supposed to know about unless I try really, really hard and follow certain rules to be able to find it. And is that an accurate picture of what the will of God is like? And I think about this, is is our Heavenly Father, uh, is He different than we are as parents? Yes, he is. But I think in this regard, maybe he's more similar to us than we paid attention to. Because I think about my children. And as I wanted to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, do you know what I did not say to them? Hey, there are things I want you to do. But I'm not going to tell you what they are. I just want you to figure it out. Like try to read my my moves and my just try to figure it out as best you can. Cool? Cool? That's not what I did. And what are we usually asking when we say we want to know God's will for our lives? What do we mean? We're actually asking, Lord, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And what are we thinking about? We're thinking about all of the big questions that come our way in life. We're thinking about, like, Lord, do I take this job or this job? Or, Lord, do I marry this guy or this guy? Or should I have this many children or this many children? Or should I stay single or should I go to the mission field? Or should I get a job? Those are two not opposing ideas. (laughs) That's the cold medicine. (laughs) Should I you know, color my hair pink. Like we can come up with all kinds of things that we're asking the Lord for his will on what should I do, what should I do, what should I do? Is that what the will of God is primarily concerned with? The thing that got me sort of questioning this honestly was because um, for many years I lived in the town of Sugarland. That's a real name for a place. It is. I currently live in Flower Mound. I moved from Sugar Land to Flower Mound. <clears throat> and uh, my husband recently said, hey, what if we looked maybe at renting a lake house on uh, Possum Kingdom? <laughs> and I thought, what is the Lord doing? I don't understand why the names are so ridiculous. <laughs> but in Sugar Land, <clears throat> um, we, we lived uh, in a neighborhood that was right across the road from a a minimum security prison. And there were uh, signs, there were signs all along the road at the entrance to our subdivision that said, caution, do not pick up hitchhikers, prison area. We were all super sad about that because we loved picking up hitchhikers so much. (laughs) But the the upstart of living there was that anytime you drove out of your neighborhood, you could look across the road and you could see the prisoners in rows, all wearing white uniforms, and there would be a guard on a horse with a gun, and they're out there just hoeing a row, hoeing a row, hoeing a row. And I remember as I was thinking about this question of decisions and the will of God, thinking, well, I know there are believers in prison, there's prison ministry, and there's all kinds of things that go on for Christian prisoners, but they don't have choices. Like, one of the things that you lose when you break the law is the ability to govern your own choices. So if you're a prisoner, you're not asking, should I wear this jumpsuit or that jumpsuit? (laughs) If you're a prisoner, you're not asking what you should have for lunch today. If you're a prisoner, you're not asking what time you're going to bed. You're not asking whether you should take this job or that job. You're not asking the relational questions outside of those immediate people who are with you. And then I started thinking, well, it's not just about someone who is physically imprisoned. What about the elderly? 
Because the aging process also removes from us our ability to make decisions. Have you noticed this? I'm trying to be a very good student of my parents aging, because I love them very much. And watching them slowly need to relinquish decision-making abilities around certain decisions is something that I'm not looking forward to. But for those of us who live a very long time, we will eventually find ourselves essentially though we feel the same on the inside, imprisoned in a body that prevents us from doing or making many of the choices that we used to make. What's the will of God for the elderly? What's the will of God for people whose circumstance has placed them somewhere where they don't have decision-making ability? Think about the decisions that we care the most about, the things that we actually take the most satisfaction in. Like, think about the decisions that you've made where you're like, and that was the Lord's will for my life. Let me just throw out a few, and you can see if any of these resonate with you. Some of you made a very definitive decision about whether you were going to do natural childbirth or take all the drugs. (laughs) I was like, jam that needle into my forehead. I'll have whatever you're serving. Some of you made a very clear decision about whether you're going to breastfeed or bottle feed. Some of you have made a convictional decision about whether you're going to eat all organic or whether you're going to slowly poison your family to death. (laughs) Some of you feel very strongly about vaccinations. Some of you feel very strongly about the way that you chose to educate your children. Some of you are choosing between Botox or bangs. The answer is bangs. (laughs) Some of you feel strongly about whether to go with traditional medicine or essential oils or some voodoo combination of both. (laughs) Some of you are deeply committed to a chemical-free home. Some of you are committed to a diet choice or a lifestyle choice. Some of you have commitments that you've made around social media use. Some of you have made commitments to live debt-free. And think about, when you think about those kinds of decisions, those things where you're like, no, I have clarity on this and I know that this is God's will for my life. What has that bred in you? Like, honestly, when you hear that someone has not made the same choice that you have, like when I told you that I wanted the drugs when I had the kids, (laughs) some of you were like, hmm. And this is what we do. This is what we do when we have our most clarity around a decision. Have you noticed how what it doesn't breed in us typically is humility? And yet we tell ourselves that the will of God for our lives is about having certainty in decision making. That if God would tell us what to do, that would solve it all. I would just point out to you in passing that there are a number of passages in the Bible where God audibly tells people exactly what he wants them to do, and they do not do it. So if you think that God telling you what to do would cause your immediate obedience and a complete peace around everything that follows thereafter, I beg to differ. But that's not the only problem with wanting God's will to be about asking what we do. I think the other problem that we run into is that decision-making seems really important to us. But if you think about it, it's really actually less important to God than it is to us. Why? Because God is always more concerned with the decision-maker than he is with the decision itself. He's always more concerned with who you are than with what you do. We think that the decision point is the big moment. We think that's where it all either falls apart or comes together. But let me ask you something. What good does it do you to choose the right job if you're still the wrong person? What good does it do you to marry the right husband if you're still selfish? What good does it do you to choose the number of children that you're going to have if you're still self-centered? And the thing with choices in our lives is we want to tell ourselves that there is always a clear right choice and a clear wrong choice in any given circumstance, but that's not actually true. There are a fair number of situations in your life where you're going to be faced with two ways that you could go, and they're morally neutral. 
So what are you supposed to do then? And I also want you to think about this from the perspective of wisdom, because what we tell ourselves when we pray to the Lord and say, Lord, tell me what I should do, is we tell ourselves that we're asking for wisdom. But have you noticed that that's not actually what you're asking for? You're asking, wisdom is taking the facts that you have and making good decisions with them. What are you asking for when you say, Lord, tell me what to do? Knowledge. And a specific kind of knowledge. Knowledge of the future. And that's kind of a dangerous formula. I don't know if you've noticed, but the scriptures are not really hot on people asking about the future. In fact, the future belongs to the Lord. It's his business. You'd do a lot of mischief with it if you knew what was coming anyway. (laughs) Think about this in human terms. Imagine if my 22-year-old son, he was home last week, and imagine if he came down to breakfast and said, Mom, What should I wear today? Should I wear the parka or the shirt? Mom, what should I have for breakfast? Should I have oatmeal or should I have eggs? Mom, what should I, and by the time he got to the third question, I'd be like, ah, ah, ah." why? Because, uh, dude, it's June in Texas. Why are you asking me questions that you already have the ability to decide for yourself about? It would be strange for my adult son to be asking me what to do, wouldn't it? Now, it's appropriate when he's a little guy, but the whole point of being a good parent to our children is that we raise them to functional adulthood. Maturity means that you're able to self-govern. It means that you have an internal mechanism for saying, yeah, this is a better choice than that one. How much more so our Heavenly Father? And yet, some of us have been believers for years, And we're still saying, which shirt should I wear? Which job should I take? And I kind of have to wonder if God isn't saying, why don't you ask me for wisdom? Because I told you I'd give you that. I said if any of you lacked it, you could ask and I would give it to you liberally. That you'd be able to discern. But do you see that what's going on there is a difference between who you are and what you do? It's in becoming this different person that we then begin to make better choices. They are the overflow of a change on the inside. If we're not careful, we can turn God just into a big cosmic advice columnist or a divine Google. Tell me what's next, Lord. Tell me what I should do. Asking God what to do does show a commendable interest in wanting to please him. But the better question is to ask him, who should I be? And if you've ever come to the Bible with a what should I do question and tried to figure out the answer, it can cause a lot of trouble in the way that we relate to the scriptures. Have you noticed that? Because you'd be like flipping to a rando verse and trying to make it answer your question. You'd be looking up at the clouds to see if anything's written there. But the minute that we begin to understand that the question of God's will for our life is about answering who should I be, all of a sudden, the Bible is filled with help for you about what his will is for your life. Because his will is that you would bear his image. Now we're Genesis 3, so we're like this quarter. The image is there, but it's been really marred. But God's will is that that image would be sharpened in you, that it would grow increasingly sharp so that when anyone looks at it, they understand that you are his. You want to know what God's will is for your life? The scriptures are not silent on it. In fact, four times in Leviticus we are told this, be holy for I am holy. Listen to where it occurs. Leviticus 11, 44 through 45, for I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am holy. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. Leviticus 19, 2, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 27, consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20, 26, you shall be holy for, to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. What's the will of God for your life? That you would be holy. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 7 says it this way. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Did you hear it? Be holy, for he is holy. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. And 1 Thessalonians is not the only place that we see that idea play out in the New Testament. We hear it on the lips of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when he says to those who are listening, you therefore be perfect for your Father in heaven is perfect. And just in case we think that Jesus is using crazy hyperbole and kind of pointing back to a weird part of Leviticus that we really don't have to pay attention to, Peter talks about it. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. What does Peter seem to think the will of God is for our lives? That we would not be conformed to the passions of our former ignorance, but that we would be conformed to the image of God. You don't ever have to ask, what is the will of God for my life again? His will is that you would be holy, that you would be sanctified, that you would be set apart. Growing in holiness means growing in our hatred of sin. But reflecting the character of God entails more than just casting off the garment of our old ways. It entails putting on the garment of our new inheritance. Growing in holiness means growing into being loving and just and good and merciful and gracious and faithful and truthful and patient and wise. It means learning to think and speak and act like Christ every hour of every day that God grants us to walk this earth as the redeemed. God's will for our lives is that we would be sanctified. And as those who have been justified, sanctification is now gloriously possible for us. The Holy Spirit working in us intends for us to grow increasingly in the image of God. And who bore that image perfectly? Christ. The exact imprint of his nature, the author of Hebrews tells us. So if you're wondering, how does a finite human bear the image of an infinite God, where should you look? To Christ. You look to Christ. What's the will of God for your life? That you would look like Christ. And so when it comes to these decision-making questions that we get into, instead of asking, should I do this one or that one, take a look at the choices before you and ask, does the choice enable me to be more loving? to be more just, to be more good? Does it enable me to be more merciful and gracious? Does it enable me to be faithful, to be truthful, to be patient and to be wise? And there are a lot of decisions for which you'd be like, I don't know, sure, maybe. Great, pick one, move forward. We have developed a problem of trusting in outcomes instead of trusting in the God of all outcomes. God can work with any decision that you make. Anybody in here looking back on a bad choice they made and able to say that the Lord used it for good? Anybody in here have a good decision that they thought was good at the time and sensed the Lord clearly leading them that direction and it totally went south on you? Please raise your hand because I have these stories and I need to know. Thank you. Oh, good. That's good. Hey, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Because maybe it's way less about making good decisions, way more about being people who image Christ. I want us to look at a story that is not about taxes. Matthew chapter 22. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me, please. I'd heard this story for so many years and I always thought that it was talking about whether or not we should pay taxes to the government. Probably because that's the way I'd heard it taught. Matthew 22, starting in verse 15. We're at the point in Jesus' ministry where the Pharisees are raising the pitch on their aggression toward him and they're trying to trap him as they've been doing and let's see what they come up with here. It says in verse 15, then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. 
And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. That sounds sincere, doesn't it? Verse 17, tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, what's the problem with the question that they're asking him? How is this a trap for Jesus? Well, if you're familiar with the time in which Jesus lived, you know that the Roman government was basically an occupying government, and they required that taxes be paid to them as the overlords. And they had even co-opted Jewish citizens into collecting taxes and giving them to Rome. And so, of course, there is a huge, in fact, Matthew, who's writing this gospel, it was such a person. He was someone who worked for the Roman government, and it was usually an extorting, uh, an extorting role. They took more than they needed. They were allowed to keep whatever they got in addition to what they owed for the tax. So they were not well-loved people. And so when the Jewish leaders come to Jesus and they ask him, is it lawful to pay the tax or not, what are they trying to do? Well, if Jesus says, yes, it is lawful to pay the tax to Rome, then what can they do? They can rally the Jews against him who do not want to pay taxes to Rome because Rome is their overlord. And if he says, no, it is not lawful to pay taxes to Rome, what can they do? They can go and report him to the Roman government as a rabble rouser and have him arrested. But Jesus is no dummy. Verse 18. But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. I think it's that word marveled that caught me in the story. I think that's where I started to realize there was something more going on here because when I read this story, I don't marvel. I'm like, okay, they had a fight over a coin and then they left. But there was something in his response that registered with the Jewish leaders. And it has to do with this coin, this denarius. Do you know you can actually buy one of these actual coins? There are a lot of them, that there were so many in circulation that they still exist today. It's an emperor Tiberius denarius. Tiberius was Caesar at the time of Jesus' ministry. You can go out on eBay and you can find them. They're between $600 and $800 depending on how good of a condition they are in. And on the face of the denarius that they would have brought him would have been the picture of the emperor Tiberius. And then around his head is an inscription that says, Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. So I would imagine that you've heard of Augustus Caesar, right? Have you heard much about the Emperor Tiberius? No, because there's not a lot to know about that guy. But in Rome, the emperor was worshipped as a god. And so when they hold up the coin with the Emperor Tiberius' face on it, essentially what it reads is, Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of God. His image stamped on the coin. Why? Because the coin belongs to him. And it starts to make more sense why they marvel, because Jesus' response is so perfectly done. Because he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. What is he saying to them? Whose image does the coin bear? Tiberius. Render to Tiberius what is his. Whose image do you bear? Render to God what is God's. You and I are like this quarter, stamped with that image, marred and dinged. We're pretty much just fodder for the parking meter at this point. But the work of sanctification, the work of growing in holiness over a lifetime spent seeking the Lord's will about who we are is to raise up that image to mint condition. Is anybody a coin collector? Hmm, I did not see one single hand go up. Oh, there's one right there. 
If you've ever gone to the Mint or know anything about coin collecting, you know that there are um, proof sets that you can get from the Mint, right? And a lot of times a proof set would be, it would be, a, it would be a quarter like this, but it would be made out of not just the base metal, it would be made out of a, a higher grade metal. It could be made out of silver or gold or something more expensive. And what it's meant to be is this idealized version of the actual coin. And I think that's a really good metaphor for us in our relationship to Christ. Jesus Christ is the living proof of God. He is humanity perfected. He is what it looks like to be holy as God is holy. And you and I, as we pursue holiness over the course of a lifetime, become living proof ourselves. So that when people look at us, though they may never open a Bible, they can see what is true about God because of who we are. And the way that it, yes, impacts the choices that we make. Certainly someone who is being conformed to the image of the Son will begin to make better choices. But the will of God is not hidden from you. You don't have to spend one more day of your Christian existence wondering what it is that God would have for you to do because I promise you in whatever amount of time that God gives you between now and when you go to glory, you will not run out of ways to grow in holiness. Does be perfect for I am perfect mean that you and I will achieve human perfection during this lifetime? No. But it means looking back on our justification out of gratitude that we've been freed from the penalty of sin. We set our faces like flint and we ask the Spirit to continually and increasingly deliver us from the power of sin during this lifetime. What is the will of God for your life? That you would be sanctified. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us in Christ the perfect representation of humanity. He is the perfect human. We pray, Lord, that we would desire to be like him, our brother, Lord, help us to be like Peter in the boat, aware of our sin before you. Help us to cry out to you, Lord, in our sin and say, change us. Bring out the image of God in me in a way that is currently obscured by that fall and that terrible thing that happened in the garden. Lord, remake me back into the image bearer that I was created to be. That I might accurately represent you to a world that desperately needs to know who you are. Father, thank you that we are stamped with your image. May it be seen in us everywhere we go. This is the will of God for our lives. And we ask it in your son's name. Amen.